Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 503rd New Social Environment. I'm Anya, the events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Carol Schmansky and Amanda Glubizi. We're thrilled to welcome Matter on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a document of resources and actions, which I will post shortly. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication art music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at The Rail. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Artist Carol Schmansky's work spans many media from sculpture and painting to video and performance. She has become particularly known for a series of sculptures in the form of invented musical instruments and particularly brass horns shaped from the alphabet that she's been making since 1993. She has been a recip recipient of numerous awards, including the Rome Prize and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. Schmansky has also collaborated with numerous composers and musicians and in 2021 presented the performance Bonum Phonemophonic Alphabet Brass Band with avant-garde trumpeter Jamie Branch at Park Avenue Armory. And our host, formerly Associate Professor at Ohio State University, Amanda Glubizi is the founding co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and is art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. She specializes in mid and late 20th century art, design and urbanism in the United States, Europe and Latin America. She is the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York. So without further ado, take it away. Great, thank you all so much for being here. And um, thank you, Anya, and thank you, Carol. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge again that this is the week of the 500th episode of the new social environment. Um, the 500th time that we've gotten together online with friends um, and, and been really a community in a really wonderful way. Um, I know that so many of you come every day, so you have some sense of how much work this is, but I just want to say again, the people at the Brooklyn Rail do a ton of work to bring this to you. Um, so thank you to all of you for, for being here and for what you do to make this possible. And I also want to point out too, that we're so lucky to be together in a community that really does seem to love each other. And I think that that's super important right now. Um, we are all thinking about our friends and family and people we don't know in Ukraine and protesters in Russia. Um, Carol's work is not necessarily something that I think of as political overtly, but I do think that the idea of being proactive in love and friendship is a political move right now. And um, so I thank you, Carol, for, for making us think about how wonderful the, the possibility of loving other people is. I, I think this is something that's so important. So let's get going. We're gonna start by showing a video um, that none of us can pronounce the name of. <laughs> um, it's, um, <laughs> oh, good job. <laughs> this is a video, um, that is kind of uh, an intro to the work that, that Carol is showing currently at Signs and Symbol, the, the gallery that she's, she's showing at right now. And so Carol, can you talk to us a little bit about this video um, and how the, the work that you had been doing kind of feeds into the work that you're showing currently? Yeah, sure. I mean, the video that you're gonna be seeing is sort of like a primer to, um, or an introduction to the performance of, of the go-between. It's a single channel video and you're not gonna hear the audio, but what the audio is are friends and family at a latka breakfast over Thanksgiving discussing whether or not I should actually pursue a performance uh, as a matchmaker um, 
in a real life setting in an attempt to break down the boundaries of life and art or obliterate the, the differences between life and art. And that, that interest really stems back from my early influences of the 70s uh, performance artists, mainly coming from the West Coast. Uh, the, that's, that's the performance angle um, uh, of the piece. The hands, the focus on the hands again takes me back to my early influences and my and the first work that I was recognized for, um, which were was a study on phonemes and and on speech. I've been um, the bulk of my work uh, practice um, is about language and about visualizing language in different forms, transmuting language. And that's a term from Roman Jakobson that doesn't mean translating one language into another, but translating one, the, the, the medium of speech into other forms. So I did that with an alphabet font that I designed back in the early nineties. And I made sculpture, videos, photography, many, many things from this, um, original font. And what you're seeing here, I guess I should maybe, maybe if that's okay, I'll just speak to what they're seeing here. Yeah, a little please, bit. please. Um, as part of the, um, the go, when I brought people together and here you, here you see the go around, I called them go arounds when they had their date. And here you see a overlapping of me playing cards with two of the participants. And that was one of the um, aspects of the date. When, they, when I brought people together, they would come to my loft. I would, I would videotape only their hands so they, they would remain anonymous. And um, the first thing they did was I'd come in, I'd introduce them and they would have to choose out of 10 or so records, a record that they wanted to listen to while they were um, having the date. And that was a way of, of kind of commenting on this was the first decision they were gonna to have to make together. And I played poker with them for roughly 15 minutes. Then I left the room and they had their, they had their date for 45 minutes. And after that, I, I ended the date. As a person who has been on many dates in my life, although not recently, um, I have to say that the, the idea of a date ending definitively after 45 minutes is such a blessing. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> there is that phase, there's nothing worse than a bad date. Uh, yeah, that's right. And, and I think that sometimes that's good because when the dates were good, people were, you know, they wanted more. And often when they left, when they left, they got together and stayed together and had a drink or went and had dinner. So, mm -hmm. so it allowed for that. And I think, I think the 45 minutes was a good, a good, um, a good enough time period. It was a good teaser. And it's, it's also the 45 minutes is this is just as an aside is a funny thing has come to mind. I want to throw it out. Um, in terms of the requirements of joining the go-between um, to participate, you had to fill out a questionnaire, which we can talk about later. But after the questionnaire was filled out, I, I had a Zoom, uh, a one-on-one -on -one Zoom with each individual and talked to them about, you know, who they were, where they came from, and what they were looking for in a partner. So I and that that's what it gave me information on how to match match the people up. What was interesting going back to 45 minutes is that I never timed that. I could, I was willing to talk to anyone for like two, three hours, but it was always like 45 minutes where it just <laughs> sort of like, well, that's it. There is enough said here. And it wasn't deliberate. It was just, it's just funny how that happened every time. That is really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, one of the things, and actually, that, that's also the therapy session time. Usually, forty oh, five minutes. <laughs> oh, that that's your your next your next phase, the next development of this project. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things that you write in the little introduction of this video is um, that basis of trust stems from my goodwill 
discerning eye and innate desire to bring people together for the sake of happiness. And I think that that's a really lovely statement, but the thing that really stood out to me about that statement was your discerning eye, because it seems that you are understanding yourself as an artist with artist training. You know, you can discern things um, formally or aesthetically that then would help you to, to um, move into this matchmaking. So can you talk about how your artistic vocation informs your matchmakerly vocation? Uh, let's see, that's, that's a difficult question. How am I gonna answer that? Um, let me step back and, and just talk a little bit about why matchmaking. I um, have always enjoyed matchmaking and, and I don't know what, what the deal is with myself, but it's kind of an um, innate desire to do that. I've been doing it since I was in my 20s. I'm, the, the minute I meet someone that's single, I start thinking, hmm, who, could, who can I set them up with? So, um, I mean, I suppose that it, it um, I'm not sure how, I think in terms of studying language and seeing um, speech and, and the way people speak and just how language works and how it's a construct in our, our society, I mean, I've spent 30, over 30 years thinking about that. I suppose that informs maybe the way I can read individuals or my interest in reading individuals. Um, I have, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I very much, I guess in the sense that, that speech is really so much a part or language so much a part of what makes up a human being. And if that's really what the subject matter of my my our artwork is that, you know, I, I guess maybe my observation skills might be better, but um, it's also just from practice and because I've, I've just been doing this so long and I do have to say I have one, one big success, um, Ellen Altfest and Rob Colvin, I mean, Ellen's an artist and Rob's a writer, I introduced them and they got married a while back and they're very happily married couple. So that was very satisfying. But um, I just, what, what I did enjoy a lot is, is that it seems like even when people came and the, and the dates weren't successful, they, they really did seem to enjoy meeting, meeting each other. And, um, and, and that gave me a lot of satisfaction, particularly during um, the COVID period, which is, with, which is still going on, but was particularly um, difficult a year ago. And as you can see here, I have, well, now I have over a hundred people that are, that have participated and I have um, brought together 33 couples in my loft. And um, so I have a, a lot of uh, video footage of people's hands that I'm hoping to do more work with. The, the study of hands is a new experiment for me. And I was thinking about it in relationship to speech and, and, and words and breaking down words into syllables and phonemes. And I, 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 I realized that hand gesture is really the, the partner of speech. <laughs> so it's really a pair, it's paired all the time with, with speech. I'm going to ask you a few nuts and bolts questions, and then I'm going to pick up on those bigger ideas. Um, so first of all, uh, you have everybody play poker. I have no idea how to play poker. So like, is go fish okay? Um, you know, like what, what happens if a person doesn't know the basics of, of what you expect right. from? Yeah, yeah. So what we did is, I should also say that Anya Bernstein was my, Bernstein was my, um, uh, comrade, assistant, managing the, the go-between um, um, part-time at when she wasn't working at the rail. And um, so we put together a um, 
you know, the, the rules of poker. And we sent that to everyone okay. when they decided to agree to have a, have a date. And so we went through, if someone, we asked everyone, if you want an explanation about how to play, please let us know and we'll tell you. So there was that. And, you know, there was a very, there were some few very savvy poker players and, um, uh, I should I should tell you a little bit of the story about where the poker idea came from. I was listening to a radio program. It's really interesting about a psychologist that um, she decided to study poker and um, and she found out that nine times out of ten, or some huge pre huge percentage, when people bluffed, they always won the game. And, and so there's lots of, there I, made me realize in, in this conversation how much uh, information comes out when you're engaged in playing something like poker and trying to figure out what the next, next guy's doing or next girl's doing. It's just so, and I also thought it would be a, a way for people to loosen up. But there was, I mean, there were a couple times when some people just didn't know how to play the game and they didn't get it. And at that point, I just said, okay, never mind. You know, just let have the date. I, I wasn't a rigid, rigid about the rules. Yeah, I guess you might be learning more from people playing poker than from go fish, but maybe like a really, yeah. really cutthroat game of Uno or something could kind of like take care of that. For yeah. You. yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things too that I, I noticed um, was... The, the hand gestures that you have in this video um, are slightly different from the hand gestures that we see in the videos currently up at the gallery. Um, and so I was kind of curious about what, what all are you, are you recording? Um, just that or, or are you also recording during the date? No, I am. I, I, the difference in the single channel and the, um, the two double channel videos in the exhibition is the people are the same. I'm not in any of the, the videos in the exhibition. I paired, I decided I had so much footage and I, I had to somehow break it down and, you know, make it into something. And so I chose one, two go arounds. And what I mean is I, in, in one day, it was the very first date that I had in my in my loft. It was a gentleman who met um, a young woman at noon that afternoon, and then that woman left, and then he met a second woman. And so, and so those two monitors, you see, you see the gentleman in both monitors, and you see different women in, in the other monitors. So that's the pairing. And um, what you're seeing there is not the card game because I really wanted to study more about the gestures, their individual gestures and the expression it brought out and the emotion it brought out and also the style of the way they use their hands. And that's why I kept it separate. So when they were recorded, their speech was recorded and I had two cameras on each individual. So that's what you're seeing in the exhibition. And, and that's what's different from the um, single channel because there you're seeing an overlapping of, of just to get a kind of a feeling of the environment of what it was like when you were in my loft during these, per these dates or go arounds as I call them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I noticed too about the video that was included in the exhibition um, is that the, the male participant, so often his gestures are palm up and the female participant, so often her gestures are palm down. Right. And I was very curious about that. Um, is this at the same time? Are they responding to each other? And so basically, are they almost like holding hands or, or do you think that they're deflecting one another? What's going on? Um, read the gestures for us. Uh, well, I think that um, the palm up can, I mean, I'm not a linguist. And so I'm not going to try to read the gestures in any sort of way. 
But I will say, okay, the individual's names are pseudonyms and, and I can give you their names. Um, Orb Innings is the gentleman. And the two women are Dolly Dawn and Booth Budding. And their names are based on time and space, which I can take in from the thesaurus, which is one of my favorite books. Um, so, so basically I think Orb, he was so expressive with his hands. It was just pure luck. Every, everything he said had a hand gesture along with it. And so I think he did a lot of talking where when he, his hands went up, it was an open gesture. He was a very uh, loving, open person and wanted people to understand what he was saying. So I would read that as, um, as kind of like, you know, or do you understand what I'm saying? Or, or we're, we're together. Uh, the, the, the palm down, I think, is a listening position. And that's, that's, I have to say how I structured the videos is based a little bit on a very basic notion that linguists um, um, have brought out, in particular, this philosopher Kendon from the UK. But in a nutshell, there's always a prep, there are three aspects to the way people move their hands. There's the preparation, which is um, really like a rest position, which could be the position of the hands down. And then there is the stroke, which is the, the biggest action and the expressive action that goes with what one is saying. And then it comes back down to what's called retraction or that could be rest. So I, I would have liked to have timed the two, I mean, made it real time, like what was going on in one and the other, but I, I was really make, trying to make it really more improvised, my trying to bring out the character and the, and the qualities of the way these people use their hands more so than it just being a document. Mm -hmm. So I made a decision not to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have been perhaps not so interesting because it would have had to be much longer yes. also. And each one of these videos are a loop and they're only about four or five minutes long. Right, and um, I'm wondering too, if perhaps we might not see we, um, the male figures on the left-hand side. So it, as English speakers, we're going to read from left to right more naturally. Perhaps we see him in the, the initiating of the gesture and then perhaps then we see her as kind of as the, yeah. you know, the finishing of the gesture and then back and forth or something. Right. I mean, I think that's probably true. I do think that the two women did not use their hands as much um, as, as Orb did, but um, like Booth definitely, she had a very funny gesture. She like would put her hands in her boots, which I thought was quite humorous, like both hands when she was listening. And Dolly had a lot of this sort of thing going on. Like, and so I, I just didn't notice patterns, you know, and, and Orb, he had a lot of like cutting, cutting gestures, you know, that, um, I wish I could understand it more and I, I am gonna study it more because this is a new area of investigation for my artwork. So maybe in a few years, I, I can answer more about their, what, what the meaning of their gestures are. <laughs> um, you had talked a little bit about the, the letter forms that you developed um, earlier in your career. And are these the same letter forms that you're then using in the test that we find throughout the gallery right now? Uh, yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recently, um, in the past, I used those letter forms to, um, in abstract ways, I would combine them over, over each other, um, cut them up and, and make abstract sculpture from them. I made natural horns because I saw the horn, the closest um, instrument to speech, which I see is shaped breath. And um, just, just to say, I think now that 
I think that the way people use gesture is that they shape their hands in, in motion in the same way that people shape their breath to make, to make a speech sound. Um, I, I made this font um, again back in the 80, late 80s, early 90s. It's not a good font in terms of being able to read it. It was really meant to be used um, to make art and not to be read. But then with the computer sophistication, I was able to download the font on my computer and actually type with it. And so that was quite, that was exciting for me. So I decided when I did the descriptions of the individuals, which was, which was very important to me, um, I decided to use my own type just to keep a continuity with, with my previous bodies of work. Um, and maybe we can talk about the descriptions a little bit since we got onto Orb and Dolly. Yeah, and great. The, the descriptions um, came from um, the questionnaires. And I, I designed a questionnaire based on, I got input from a lot of friends um, as to what kind of questions would be important. But for instance, the, I'll, give, I'll give examples of two questions. The first question is, what is most important to you? Work, family, friends, wealth, health, pleasure, other, please specify. And then the second question is, are you comfortable meeting new people? Yes, no, not sure. So like that second question comes from the film Harold, Harold and Maude, which I had watched um, um, around the time I was uh, making up this question and, and Harold's mother, I mean, maybe you know this film. I, it's, um, it was a very funny film. It's a great film. I recommend watching it, but um, he, his mother um, is trying to set him up on, on, with, a match, with a matchmaking service and she has to fill out this questionnaire. And so she's asking him the questions and he, he's not answering any of them. She's answering them for him. But they're really funny questions. And, what, and, and so I have out of 30 questions, probably about 12 of them are from the Harold and Maude questionnaire. And are you uncomfortable meeting people is, was one of those. Um, uh, clearly, what are your pronouns and sexuality preference? That's more of a modern, that, that was not really probably being asked back in the 90s or 80s, whenever that film was made. But um, so what I did, so the descriptions is that I summarized the, the, the questionnaires and I, I wrote, things about the people and, and in a summary form. And, and I, I, I like doing that. I really enjoyed that part of it. That, and, and, and then I, I, I tried it out on the, on the first three people that, and, and I, liked, I liked it. So I decided to put it in the show. And then these, these um, drawings that you see are my rendering of their faces off of the Zoom calls I had with them. So I would take stills from the Zoom and, and just do these very rough sketches just to kind of get a sense of the personalities. But like for Dolly, you know, I, I don't know if people can read that. I prefer men who aren't overly submissive. I'm also not interested in someone overly domineering. I'm very liberal. I won't read all of it, but you know, I really loved, I love laughing at the end. That was nice, I thought. I, I liked too that she said that she really likes reading. Yes. I reading. was like, okay, maybe I could go on a date with Dolly. <laughs> that yeah, was <laughs> I know. So a lot, well, the question, one of those questions is how much time do you spend reading? That was, I felt like, you know, I'm married to somebody who, never is not reading. So I thought that's something I think about a lot, given that I don't, I'd like to read more than I do, but it was how much time do you devote to reading? And I got a really wide range of answers from people. It was that, that was one of the more interesting questions actually. I, I'm married to someone who consulted a structural engineer to see if his books would actually collapse our building. <laughs> so I understand <laughs> what you go through. <laughs> um, 
I want to ask you too about um, these sentences feel very much like they're taken from the person themselves. Um, so many I sentences, for example. Um, you know, I'm looking at this one. Um, I'm straight. I'm an atheist. Um, I, I, I. However, when we look at the sentences that you diagram, they are not necessarily I sentences. And so I'm kind of curious about that. Is that because it's, it's more visually interesting to diagram a sentence that isn't so straightforward? Um, you know, what, what is your process there? Yeah, in, in, this, in this summary, you're, you're correct in saying I took exactly what they wrote. So um, there's a, a space after like what's more important to you, um, choose one. And many, and in, in this case, these three individuals wrote um, more. They, they didn't just answer the questions, yes or no, or not sure. So they wrote more. And, but I mean, clearly on how would you describe your sexuality preferences? Orb wrote, I'm straight. And um, then there was a question on religion. You know, does your personal religion or philosophy include life after death? That was also a Harold and Maude question. Well, he, he wrote, I'm an atheist. So, you know, when I, when I, he wrote a lot of that. So all of these eyes, I did not, that's the way they were written. And sometimes I cut the sentences off. Now, in the case of the sentence diagram, um, I want to read the sentence diagram. <laughs> um, how you pair is that in itself a form of description or description or help me out here someone description or um interpretation so i left off description and interpretation but that was the sentence and that was that was a phrase that, um, or a question that Dolly asked of Orb in their conversation. They had a really very interesting conversation. Orb is a writer and Dolly is a writer and, and a poet. And so she was commenting about how, how he, on, her, on his writing. And I found that that particular phrase so perfect for this this body of work that how you pair is in itself a form and you know so that's why i took it and um if you think about uh hand movements in a stream um like like streams of gesture I, I wanted to, I, I, I guess I'm separating the streams out into, into segments. And I felt that the sentence diagram format does that with sentences in the same way that I wanted to do with the stream of hand gestures. And so that's the connection. This is also a, a new, um, body of work for me. And I very much like how sentence diagramming goes and how it's, you know, looks like it's, I just like graphically how it looks. So I'll probably, I'm going to be doing more of these in the future with, with other phrases. Uh, so I wanted to use, I couldn't use their voices because everyone had to stay anonymous. So I um, really did, it was very important for me to pick out fra small phrases that wouldn't reveal too much about the people, but that would give a, a sense of the character of, of who they were. And you see these phrases also in the Polaroids that, that I have um, in the show. I'm thinking about the, the sentence diagrams too, at least that are in the show. Um, they are, they have some neon elements as well. And so how, how did you make that determination between paint versus, versus the neon? Um, neon is a completely seductive material for me. I'm not a painter 
and I love neon. That's, I love, if I had a lot of money, I would make a lot of neon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I can't, I can't say um, why. I just, I just <coughs> like what it looks like. It's a completely visual choice. And um, similarly, I guess with the, the sentence diagramming, um, I know we have fans of sentence diagrams in the audience right now. At least one person has already mentioned in the chat <laughs> about <Uh-oh>. sentence <laughs> diagrams. Um, I am of the generation where like just before me, people were being taught to diagram sentences and they were actually in my textbooks and we were all getting nervous because we were gonna learn them. And then like, it never was taught to us. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm of the age where it was just like completely dropped as a skill. Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of curious about them too. I mean, for me, aesthetically or formally, I actually really love them as well, although I don't understand them. Um, And so I'm kind of curious for you, um, I I assume you've been taught how to diagram sentences and that these are the way that these sentences would be diagrammed correctly. Um, But- Well, it's funny, it's funny. I, I was never very, I was taught how to diagram a sentence. I'm not very good with grammar. Um, so I asked um, my husband, who's a writer, I asked two of my close friends that are writers. Um, I asked a, a young man who's getting his PhD in linguistics. So I asked four separate people, I sent this to them and I said, can you please diagram this for me? And my husband did the diagram and he knew how to do it. I, and and you know, he's around my age. The two writers, the younger ones, they're in their late 30s, had no clue about how to do a sentence diagram. (laughs) I know that 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 my daughters don't know how to do it. So yes, it's a lost, it's kind of a lost thing, but it shows you how to how, you know, what's an adverb, what's a preposition, where it is, how to, you know, there is that. I think that's very cool. And I guess I liked it because um, in in terms of working with the visual aspect of words and language, this is one that linguists use. They've taken on breaking down the, the classic, you know, left to right on, on the line. And I like looking at the words, um, you know, horizontally and in a diagonal way. And so visually, mm-hmm. I like it very much. But yeah, I guess I, I don't know what they do instead of, I don't know how they teach grammar today, um, if they still do that. But the, the linguist PhD student was very technical about it. And he even got into, he sent me a whole page about what was going on there and how it could be interpreted and you could do it this way or that way. So it is a, you know, it still exists, it's, it's, it's there. Um, and also, I don't know if you know, this is another thing in the work. I, the phrases that are underneath the Polaroids coming from what, the, what these three people had said, I had friends of mine write them because they're, they're, they are not, they are not um, handwritten by the, by the participants. And that was important to me because what, what I guess maybe everybody knows, but they're not teaching handwriting any longer script in, in, the, in classrooms. And I find that very sad. And so I really wanted people, I wanted to try to bring that out in the work as, as you know, just a, another layer because, um, because it is something that, that people aren't going to know how to do in in probably five ten years, they're not going to know how to write their signature. It's so true, and it's such a strange thing, right? Because of course, cursive writing is is the coursing script, right? It's the thing that allows you to write quickly. Um, which I always thought about when I was teaching. You know, my students would take forever to write their exams, 
And it's because they were all printing them, oh, um, yeah. you yeah. know, and like I taught at Ohio State. So like these football players would turn in exams, like written all in bubble letters and stuff like that, you know, and I, I, it was both adorable and also like, oh my God, your hands must be cramping so horribly. Um, so it's kind of wonderful to see these photographs of hands making gestures and then to think about the handwriting as a hand. Yeah, because the, exactly. And the hand is very, and that's the interpretive part of, of handwriting is, is the script. And I remember once applying for a job and they were completely serious about this after they, in order to, they, they made me take a handwriting test and they, they are serious people that that analyze handwriting in terms of whether or not you're a crook or what kind of personality you have. Now that I'm thinking about this, if I do this again, I, I am going to get the people to, to write to write the expressions after I've decided what I want. Because I think that could also be kind of a nice thing as opposed to being disconnected, you know, to see how someone writes writes. You'll be able to tell the age of your participants just based on whether they're writing <laughs> in person right. or whether Yeah, they're that's right. That's exactly in print. right. <laughs> um, yeah. I have one more question about this, and then I, I think that I'll move on to other questions. And that's, you mentioned um, whether the, the dates were successful or not. And I was very curious about this. How did you determine whether the dates were successful. Was it you? Was it the people? And, and what made a date a success? Um, I, well, I think if people enjoyed meeting each other, it was a, a success. Um, it was a huge success if they went out afterwards. And, and that did happen, I would say 30% of the time. So it wasn't a, I wasn't a great hit, hit ratio. I think one of the biggest problems with my matchmaking capabilities is that my pool is very small. And the pool of participants come from my mailing list, which means I know everybody there. Um, they're predominantly artists and writers. They, come, they came from my husband's mailing list. Okay, so he's a writer, so I had lots of writers. And then from my dealer of signs and symbols, Mitra's mailing list. And so it was a combination and it's, it was quite restrictive in that way. So that was a difficult thing. It's different than the, the dating websites where you've got masses and masses of people. Um, but to be, I, I, do, I was encouraged, I was discouraged that there weren't too many people that really wanted to stay together. That was discouraging. But what was encouraging is that the majority of the people that came for a date um, wrote to me and said, I'd like to come again, <laughs> you know, to meet somebody else. So that made me, I, you know, that was successful, I, I suppose. Um, I never followed up. I, I would follow up once. I would, I would say, do you want to get this person's email or contact details? Let me know. And that's all I did because I, I'm not a I'm not getting involved in, you know, it's not about getting involved in people's personal lives. Right. And, yeah. So it, it, it generally, it usually ended there, except for people that were my, my very close friends, of which there were a few. So I'm just trying to think of like what the, the hit rate must be on one of the like dating apps. And it, uh -huh. I would be amazed if it were 30% success. So I think you're actually doing really well. Oh. Oh, well, <laughs> um, one of the things too that I, I had actually been thinking about and then it's kind of alluded to in the press release as well is the, the role of the female matchmaker. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of in, in the past, of course, arranged marriages, but also um, in terms of love matches, which I think is, is a really, really wonderful way of thinking about matchmaking, not just whether you're like, financially um, working together, but whether you actually might have good personalities that would work together and you could actually fall in love. And so I was very, very curious about that, about um, how you feel about assuming what could be understood to be a very, very traditional role for a woman. Yeah, I think that, um, 
I thought about that and I spoke to, to people about that before I started the project because I certainly, I didn't, I guess I am a bit of a, it's, it is like a meddling in people's affairs. Um, my younger daughter was very much against me doing this because she thought it, it was, a, it would be bad karma. It would be interfering <laughs> and, you know, perhaps she's right. But um, I, I never really thought of it much about being female um, um, occupation I, I, or activity. I did do a little research about that. The first match, matchmaking officially started in the 1100s um, and it was done by um, uh, religious people, clergy. And then in the 1600s, um, the parish got involved in England and where it was always tied to an economic thing. So, um, so if, if there was an analogous thing in terms of my, my process, it's probably my pool of people are mainly artists and writers. So it was, you know, it was kind of like, that's what I was dealing with. Um, and not so much the social, you know, whether or not people had money or not. Although one of the questions is how important is money is money to you. And um, overwhelmingly people said very. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Maybe because they're all artists and writers, right? Yes. <laughs> well, they did say yes, it's important as long as I can live in a decent way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was but then it became actually in the 1800s, it's, it was the first like dating where it, it, I guess it was because where it came out with that was that there are a lot of women that did, had time on their hands, they weren't working. And so they, they started thinking about these things. Um, I do think that women are more interested in, in relationships and than men are, um, just in terms of my, my, my friend group or the people around me, I've noticed, you know, much more interest from, from the female side. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, I'm sure there's been studies on that. I don't know that much about it. I, I am the product of, of matchmaking. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to think oh, of, are. I am. And so I think, I think it was pretty equally male and female who were, who are working uh -huh. um, over time <laughs> to, to bring my husband and myself together. And I'm incredibly grateful of them, to them for their meddling actually, um, because I don't think he would have thought twice about me otherwise. So <laughs> you need that person. You're You're very quiet. close to home with this project. Yeah, I am. I know. I've thought about this a lot, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, thank God for the meddlers in the world. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. um, as you move forward with this project, assuming that you do, can you see gesture um, expanding beyond the hand into the full body? Because, of course, this is something... Um, that we start to realize, um, not just when we start thinking about gesture more, more specifically, but also when we, when we read philosophy of, of gesture and meaning, that gesture can actually encompass the whole body. And it can be um, the way that we position ourselves and respond to a person or the way that um, we hunch our shoulders or something like that. And so yeah. you, you see this as being then kind of more like a a three-dimensional full body performance? It definitely is three-dimensional whole body. Um, and, you know, that would be something that I would, I think dancers study that. I mean, I think that that's, it, it clearly is involved with hands like nodding your head for, I mean, that's the most obvious, you know, or <laughs> you know, this, that sort of stuff. And, and people have studied body language. I, I, maybe I'll get to that, but that's, yeah, no, definitely it's a part of, of the language mm -hmm. system that, mm -hmm. that we have. Um, but I do think that somehow, as I said, the hands are more specifically or more concretely tied or partnered with speech than, mm -hmm. than the body. And, and um, there was, 
there was a point where I was trying to figure out where does language come from? Because it really is con the construct of our thought process. And there is, um, I, I do think that, that, that the first language were, was, hand, was hand gesturing. So that's what um, St. Augustine said, right? Yeah. Right. Well, you point to something and then we follow. Yeah, the, exactly. The so it, it's a very fundamental part of, of the communication that humans have. So I guess I have to deal with the hands. I've got a lot of books that I want to read about, about um, hand gesturing and um, like that's a listening position, but one that I feel like is one is a questioning, mm -hmm. you know, kind of expression, but definitely a listening position. It would be interesting to think about um, having your your daters also understand what their gestures might mean and how that might actually cause them to be very conscious of what what they are doing as as they're meeting other people and as they're going on these dates. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a lot of it has a, shows a lot of, you know, not insecurity, but just sort of, you know, being a little bit nervous. There are a lot of nervous gestures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of people, the, the rest positions, people touch their hands a lot. I mean, the, the, the holding one's fingers like this is very common, was common all throughout all the gesturing. And, you know, I really need, to, there, there will, what I'd like to do is, is have my own vocabulary of hand gestures. That's, that's really where, I, in, as an art form, and really study the videos that I have, the, the um, 33 hours, <laughs> which I haven't had a chance to do. I've only really watched about six of them, to be honest, because it's, it's there, you know, to, but because you do see repeated, you see repeated um, gestures over and over. And, and I thought maybe I could do drawings and do, and try to work something up with that. That, it, that would be something I'd like to do. There was a book that was kind of floating around museum gift shops like 10 years ago about like Neapolitan hand signals. Oh, yeah. Like, like that. so that you could like put your hand in your pocket and curse someone. And um, yeah. I found that to be really useful, actually. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that these sorts of these sorts of books could be very, very helpful. <laughs> well, I started reading this book that David Carrier got me, and I don't know if he's still on on the um. But, but that was also very useful. And it was about that. It was about the Roman, the Roman gestures, you know, in, in sculpture. And that was, that was great. So that, yeah, a lot what you do with your thumb, right? Lot <laughs> and then there's a linguist bird whistle that's written a lot on it. I want to read that. So, you know, just summer activity. <laughs> yeah, I just came across bird whistle in some other respect. And um, that's a great name and yeah. a perfect name for a person who might study these sorts of things, right? right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, let me, let me end with just a few quick questions for you. Okay. Um, is the quality of the food you eat important? <laughs> yes, definitely, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> what is your favorite kind of reading? Um, favorite kind of reading probably is philosophy. I think, I think we could all have gathered that <laughs> from this conversation today. What is your connection to nature? Uh, I have a very close connection to nature, particularly as I get older. But as a child, I spent my entire childhood running around in the woods. So I think I'm very connected to, to nature and I appreciate it more and more as, as I get older. I always think about the, the best joke of the 1970s film canon, I'm at two with nature. Is yeah. space or time more important to you? Space. Oh, an <laughs> unusual know. answer. I know. Well, I, oh, so you studied, you studied the handbills. So of course I did. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. We didn't mention the handbill. So a, uh, a young man, Xander Biederman, who's a mathematician, studied math at, 
um, and was a friend um, of, of my daughter's. Um, he was one of the people, well, I shouldn't say that, I take it back. I met him at my house and he, I saw that he could make charts and graphs. And so he made up all these beautiful graphs for me. I thought they were very beautiful. And so I, I um, with Anya, we summarized all the data and put it together and, and sent this information to him. And he was able to um, do a color coded statistical analysis of the pool of participants that I had based on the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a handbill that's um, given out at the gallery. If anyone's interested, you can have one for free. <laughs> I have mine sitting right next to me. <laughs> I, I wonder if the answer to this question changes as we get older. Yeah, it was interesting. People really said time and um, I think that if I had a lot of time and I was in a space I didn't like, I think that would bother me a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say that. And I did have one great answer from someone who said, oh, come on, they're the same thing. That was their answer. So um, that's the like astrophysical answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess there was more than one. I didn't even see that, but same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but most people said time and I think yeah, I think most of the younger people said time. I wonder if this has something to do with COVID fallout. Yeah, probably, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, well, everyone seemed to have lost a couple of years, at least for some people. Yeah, it's both compressed and expanded in ways that I don't fully understand. <laughs> yeah, and time and space has totally changed completely since COVID. Yes. I mean, like getting back into the calendar was very difficult for me. Like I, I used, used to have a very close calendar I watched. I would look at it every day and then I just forgot about looking at it and then having to go back to it was, was very difficult. I find too that um, when I try to speak to people in person without my mask on, I get all stumbly now. It's a very strange thing. Yeah, I know. So I can't imagine dating right now, but to those of you who are dating, I salute you. Well, actually, I would say that during the, the dates, everybody had to wear masks. So that was, that was uncomfortable. And oh, I'm sure. Then I've met some of these people since then where I could see their faces and it was such a, a nice thing. It was a really totally different experience. <laughs> Well, Carol, we are right at the two o'clock mark. And so I wanted to ask you first, is there anything that you really wanted to talk about that I haven't touched on um, um, in my questions? Let's see. I guess um, just if you go into the gallery, it's just a small thing. There's a soundtrack and the soundtrack is our two records that the two dates chose. And that's why you're hearing that music. And then you're also hearing um, Harold's mother ask the questions. And my, um, my intent there was just to try to set a little bit of the environment of what it was like when, you, when the people came and just get a little ambience going around the, around the hands. So if, if, if you do see the exhibition and you're wondering what, what is this, that, that's what it is. What were the albums? Oh God. Um, I, don't I need to, I need to know this because I've had the one soundtrack going through my head since I was at oh. the <laughs> so, so I Maybe need to Anya can, I, I should have the names of them. Um, on Anya knows, um, yeah, what I think they I are, so maybe that. she can type them in or she did know what they were, but <laughs> I'll find out. Okay. I thought that would be great. <laughs> Well, Carol, thank you so much for answering these questions. You've been such a wonderful um, raconteur and interlocutor. So I'm going to turn it over to Anya and Nick now so that they can field some questions for you from our participants. Thank well, you thank so you much. Thank you very much, Amanda. It was a pleasure and I hope we can meet each other someday. I hope so too. I, I hope so too. That. Let's do that. Let's keep the dialogue going. And I just want to thank the rail and everyone involved in it and Thanks very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Carol, for coming on. And Amanda, this has been one of the 
I mean, I have a personal connection. So obviously I'm enjoying this so much, but this has been like one of the nice okay. conversations. So one of the records, <laughs> Roy Eldridge, that's, that was the, uh, one of them. And the other one was Japanese uh, jazz. Yeah, I have that. Name. I actually have that record at my house, so maybe yeah, go. that's right. I, I was thinking <laughs> to go get it, and then I realized it. it's not not here. <laughs> I have it, but I also have it saved on Spotify, so I'll definitely find it um, okay. in a moment. Um, we have some questions from the audience, which I'd love to turn to okay. now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, please no questions on sentence diagramming. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is happen. the adverb? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a question about sentence diagrams, but a more um, conceptual one. So, um, Suzanne, if you're here, yeah, I found you. You should be able to turn on your microphone. Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering, um, there's just so few artists who use the sense diagram, and I'm enamored of it myself, even though I was never trained to parse um, grammatically. But I see them as um, found poetry, especially if you're not trained and you don't know the proper order. So you come up with all different sorts of word combinations, you know, which sometimes are quite, quite poetic or sometimes quite uh, amusing. So I was wondering if you can see them that way and all, or as word pictures. And um, I had another question. I think Amanda's um, comment about a uh, question about the Neon answered it, but I was wondering if you use other materials or you thought of using other materials for your sentence diagrams. And I also love neon. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. No, I definitely, that's that's really like the next kind of thing I would like to try with the wall drawings. I wanna keep, I, I, have, in, I have in the past, um, you know, I love neon. So I, I wanted just to do that one little section. And I felt like, um, again, the diagramming allows for sectioning off of certain areas, so it was perfect for that. Um, I think what I would do in, in the future is I would silk screen the, the text on the wall um, and use more neon or maybe just do all neon. Um, but definitely I've thought about the poetic aspect of how it could be, I could take the phrases and they would just naturally in a random like cage-like fashion, you know, the throw of the dice make combinations of, oh. of phrases that I think could be very cool. So that's actually really something I want to do more of. And I'm, I wanna make a set of drawings on that. Um, I'm gonna start that after the show comes down. <laughs> Sounds great, thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, our next question will be coming from uh, G.E. Schwartz and you can unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anya, and congratulations for, for helping to supply the music and all the other things. And, and thank you, everyone, for this. I, I by the way, uh, I always thought of uh, when I was a kid, I thought of the um, the diagram of sentences in a sort of spatial way of seeing them almost as bobles, you know, kind of like a, a Calder kind of thing. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but hanging suspended in the middle of a room, you know, in different yeah. different angles and whatnot. At any rate. The question I have, and I love this entire project because it, 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 it's so sort of at the same time kind of mimics and picks up a kind of sense of a sociological experiment and study. And, and would you say that your work, and, and because I, would you say that your work is, uh, has a focus on the construction of reality and trying to discover the construction of reality as opposed to the discovery of reality? I think I would say the construction of reality, definitely. Um, because I think our, our, our world is constructed by our language and our understanding of language. So, um, and then maybe the discovery part comes in with how I decide to use the information I have. Um, but, but I am really interested in the construction side of it. It's, it's very, very close to a study of a sociology called ethnomethodology, if you're not familiar with that. Oh, I'll write that down. Oh, yeah. Ethnomethodology. It's a study of people's ways and thinkings, and it goes from their point of view oh. and the way they oh. describe their thing rather than a sociologist coming and saying, oh, well, it must be this way. 
So it's, yeah. a, it's, it's, it's learning from the bottom up and, you know, and that could very generative that way. But anyway, I think- How does that so much... connect to kinesics? Is that at all connected? Um, well, I don't know about that, I, I, okay. uh, but I do know that they have done work with hand gestures. Oh, um, okay. Oh yeah. Um, is there and, somebody in mind that you? Yeah, there, there was a wonderful book by the name of uh, <clears throat> uh, by uh, one of the uh, practitioners of ethnomethodology by the name of David Sudnow, and I okay. put it in the chat um, okay. called "Ways of the Hand," oh. and it is a way of his his learning his own gestures of hand gestures while oh. he's learning to teach himself piano. Wow. Oh, it's a, it's an amazing book. It's uh, you know I think the early 80s or so, but it was a groundbreaking book in sociology at the time, but then had all these other, you know, kind of graphic. Okay, definitely. So anyway, it's out. there. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, GE. That, that was such a generative question. I can't wait to see um, what you do with that, Carol. Um, our, our next question will be coming from Al You've frozen, Anya. <laughs> Can we now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I was about to turn to Ellen, who now you should be able to, to unmute. Perhaps. Hi. Oh, there you are. Hi. Oh, hi, Carol. <laughs> it's Ellen. Oh, it's you, Ellen. Great. My, my, uh, yeah, Ellen is is I shouldn't say, is is the one I I match made and was successful. <laughs> yeah, before the product, I didn't yeah, know before, I was being match made. That right? No, no, she was not a part of the go between. This was many many years ago. <laughs> but I've been co closely following the go between, and I love. I wish I could be a, a matchmaker too, but I haven't had the success that Carol has. But. Um, I mean, I've, I've watched this whole process project really, I've been really interested in it. And um, my question is um, what the role of intuition in the matchmaking process is. And if being a matchmaker is a metaphor for, could be seen as being a metaphor for being an artist because to my, my idea is that artists and matchmakers are kind of our channels for some higher thing so instead of just doing the art or, or 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 putting two people together as a brilliant idea it's something that kind of occurs and that you flow with and i sort of see you as a very intuitive person so i wonder if, if you see the connection between being an artist and being a matchmaker um definitely and i would say that um that the intuitive part of the matchmaking is probably 90% of it. And the 10% is, is all the other things because um, you just really never know who's gonna, you, who's gonna match really. I, and there's, very, there's a lot of surprises. Um, I do think that, um, that I always set up structures for, for before I start making work. And, and then in the end, I just forget, they just go away. I, I just go back to the intuitive. So yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that's a nice analogy. I, I appreciate that. I think that, that, um, that, yeah, that's a good connection. And I think that gets into the phrase of how you, how you um, pair in it, is in itself a form, you know, and that gets into the element of, you know, of, of, of art making. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I the congratulations and um, thank you for answering my question. Yeah, thank you very much for listening, Ellen. See you soon, I hope. See you soon. Thank you, Ellen. Um, our next question, which is, I think, sort of a continuation of what you're just saying, uh, Carol, will come from Lynn Crawford. Hi. Hello. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Hi this Lynn. is so cool, Carol. Thank you. Um, Thank you. One thing I just, my husband runs a, a neon sign company oh, okay. <laughs> in Detroit. So just so you all know, wow, but okay. it, it is a very cool thing. I'm curious, um, 
if you learned more, or maybe you learned the same with um, about your pro the process you implemented and the questions that you asked and how they fared as questions and the individual humans who, um, who enacted this, did you learn more about the people or your process or the same? I think I learned more about the process mm. because I, I didn't get that involved with each individual person. I, I probably spent um, um, one hour if they came to my house and I spent an, I spent two hours in total with most of these, with the majority of my participants. So mm -hmm. I don't think I really got to, to know them, but in terms of the process, I got to know the, the way it worked and what things meant. So I think, I think it fed my matchmaking abilities in the sense that, you know, I could read people, I could pretty much know at the end of every um, go around, um, and you know, Anya was with me for many of them, and I would say that that didn't, that was not, they're never going to see each other again. Like I, I could figure <laughs> out that it wasn't going to happen. So, the process, um, I think it fed the process more, you know, um, just because, and maybe over time, I mean, I still have this ongoing project, and I still have many of the people that haven't matched because of the, uh, the pool is small, you know, and I would like to keep it going and hope that, you know, as I get to know, I've gotten to know some people very well, um, but across the board, I would answer that, that it's the, I got to know more and more about the process. And, um, you know, I recently tried a new um, strategy of bringing people together. I um, took, I, I had two people meet me at, at, this, at the Ledlow House. It's a private club in the Lower East Side. And I introduced them and I decided to draw their hands. This was like completely new thing um, because um, I have so much video recorded material that I just wanted to try something different. And then I left them there and they wound up spending like 10 hours together. Like that would have never happened oh, no. in, in, in this situation in my studio. Like, and, and they, got to, they got something more from, got to know each other more than perhaps, they had more opportunity in that situation. So whether it's good or bad, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not gonna comment on and I'm not making judgments, but you know, that is, that is something that informed me, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll look up your neon. I, you know, I'm definitely always looking up your neon. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> so many good um, recommendations in the <laughs> in the Q and A today. Um, thank you so much, Lynn. As always. Um, earlier, Carol uh, mentioned David Carrier, her friend um, and an editor at large at the Rail. And I just wanted to see uh, David if you wanted to chime in here. Um, or just say hi. <laughs> oh, okay. Is it working now? The, the yeah. Mic? yeah. Well, okay. David, you can tell me that, tell everybody the name of that book that you recommended that I've read like oh, almost okay. finished. It's no, so I, great. I have it. In there. You want to see the pile here? Huh? The pile. Okay. Uh, but there was a, it's a very Italian example because it's a, it's a Neapolitan uh, priest who, who had a theory, a very interesting theory that the kinds of gestures you found in Pompeii when it was being excavated in the 19th century and what the contemporary Neapolitans had were the same. And the reason he did this politically was he wanted to dignify the common people. But you know, if you think of your project, Carol, I mean, Naples is a place where everything is more extravagant. You know, there are whole books devoted to how do you speak Neapolitan, which doesn't involve words, but involves gestures. And, Whereas how do you speak Swedish where, you know, you're very huh. closed in, you know, I mean, it's one of those cliches that has some truth to it. But what I was uh, about thinking about in the project, and really this is the question is, I was thinking, of course, with COVID and this whole system that we have here, 
and even just watching, you know, as you gave this wonderful talk, you see how odd it is, because on one hand, we have this great intimacy, we have nice big images, we can see each other, we can see all these people at different places. But on the other hand, we're hopelessly handicapped. You know, I mean, the whole thing is this kind of, it's like we're all wearing mittens, right? And I mean, I at least during COVID have had these whole conversations with people and then I walk away and I figure, but wait a minute, they were wearing a mask, I was wearing a mask, what did they say? And I wonder, have you thought of how, I mean, obviously it's a serendipity that your whole project came along at this moment when we have this peculiar new access, but at the same time, new barriers. I mean, I don't know how to draw that as a hand gesture. Yeah. Well, that just gave me a good idea. I mean, that was interesting because I hadn't thought about that, but that's right, because that in a way, I, I wanted a way into recording hands and the, this performance allowed me to do that because everyone wanted to be anonymous. Um, but I, when I did the Zoom calls, I, I like when we're Zooming, we, well, I see Anya's hand, but you see a little bit of my hands, but you, you predominantly see people's heads. And I think I, now I really feel like if I continue this and I do the Zooms, I've got to get people to just put, um, put the camera somehow on their hands. I think that could be very cool, you know, because yeah. in a way that's that, you know, we, we get to see each other, but, but actually maybe that's what came out because as I said, you don't see their heads. If you, you wouldn't have seen their faces anyway, they all had masks on. Right. So you got more out of what was going on by looking at their hand gestures. <laughs> I guess I just got lucky, lucky with that. But yeah, we're missing a whole, a whole thing without the face, particularly the little kids, you know, that sure, sure. learning and language. I pursue that. I mean, this is very academic, but think about art historically and the whole history of Baroque gestures where learning what the gestures mean. What does this mean? What does this mean? Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I had one experience in my teaching in China where I was being taken around by the guide and looking at a whole bunch of Buddhas. And uh, it wasn't the most exciting afternoon. And suddenly I realized that in all of those seated Chinese, with my hands up Buddhas, that's the hand gestures. This means one thing, this means another thing, this means something else. And once you saw those coded gestures, you suddenly everything communicated. And yeah, and they're all in those sculptures too. Yeah, they're they're shown in the sculptures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and it's fascinating. Things. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, this is really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, uh, for jumping in. Um, yeah, I see a lot of sign language clapping <laughs> happening. Um, finally, I wanna I wanna just turn to Bridget over at uh, Signs and Symbols. Um, hi, Bridget. Hey, um, this is great, Carol. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, you know, from the other end, it's been amazing to see people respond to the show. And Carol mentioned there are two takeaways. There's the handbill and the questionnaire for participants. And between the opening and like the first weekend, I don't think I've ever seen a takeaway go so quickly. Um, it completely ran out. So we're printing more and it shows that there's this hunger for people to connect, whether or not that turns into a long lasting relationship, but people seem really interested in meeting each other and seeing what happens, where that goes. I think it is hard to meet people right now. And even if there's masks, to me, there's something so tangible about hands. Like it's very physical, which is something that we've been maybe missing this year. Um, but since we're also talking about the sound and I have been listening to it all the time. I thought I would put the nuts. <laughs> and you guys can experience the show for a minute there. Can you hear it? Too faintly. Faintly. But no. it's there. Yeah. <laughs> so, it was a good idea. <laughs> Please Thank come you. to the show and hear the sound. That's mm -hmm. thanks to Drew Vogelman for putting the soundtrack together for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really nice experience. 
Um, Anya, you are fabulous to work with and still hopefully be working together. Yes. I mean, yeah, it's been such a, a pleasure. And I mean, you've given me so much. So thank you, Carol, for everything. Um, and not not to plug, but the <laughs> it is ongoing. And, and Nick did uh, put the, the questionnaire in the chat earlier if you're just interested in perusing the questions. But also, it's a very fun project, as you can see now. So I don't know. The, the pool is open. Um, I feel like uh, that's a, a, a great note to um, to wind down the conversation um, and move to our poetry reading, which is um, our tradition at the rail to close with the reading. Um, and today I'm thrilled to welcome um, S. David to the stage. S. David is a writer and artist from the US Capitol Metro area, focusing on culture and memory at the margins. In addition to the Brooklyn Rail, his words have appeared in Ars Technica and Dweller among other forums. And he is also one of the rail's production assistants. So S. David, um, please close us out. Thanks so much for that terrific intro, Anya. Um, this is the second time I've read poetry for the new social environment and I'm happy to be here. Today I'll be reading Ilya Kaminsky's poem, We Lived Happily During the War, <coughs> which was the closest thing to a consensus pick among the staff here at the rail. We lived happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed around my bed, America was falling in a visible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun in the sixth month of a disastrous rain in the house of money, in the street of money, in the city of money, in the country of money, our great country of money. We forgive us lived happily during the war. Thanks. That's good. Thank you, S. David. And I, I've put that um, poem up just now into the chat if you'd like to read it. Um, thank you for that conclusion. And thank you um, to Carol and Amanda for this lively and wonderful conversation. This has just been so much fun. Um, thank you to Bridget and to Mitra from Signs and Symbols for helping to make today's event possible and making those videos um, and works accessible. We encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, and this will be uploaded shortly. Um, I encourage you to share it and watch it. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Bo Mendez and Ksenia M. Soboleva on the event of the exhibition Capital Reef at Miguel Abreu Gallery. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Jan Freeman. And you now can um, all turn on your microphones to say thank you and goodbye. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Brilliant conversation. Brilliant work. Thanks for sharing that sound, Bridget. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, David, for sharing Ilya's poem. I love it. Great friend. Great, great choice of poem. Yeah. Thank you, Ty, for bringing the poem up. Thank you so much. Much love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There, there. Take care. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Ciao.